Hello ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about volcanoes, which is some of the happy, fun, cool stuff that happens as a result of plate tectonics that we covered in last time's lecture. So let's start off with some things you need to know. A volcano is defined as a place on the Earth's surface where the hot molten rock or magma breaks through. As we'll see, there are many different types of volcanoes and material that has erupted. However, in general, a volcano is classified as active if it erupts lava, rock, gas, or ash, or if it shows seismic or earthquake activity. A volcano is dormant if it hasn't erupted for a long time, less than one million years ago, but could again one day, and an extinct volcano will never erupt again, usually because the plates have moved far enough away from the magma upwelling so that it can no longer come up. Magma is the molten rock beneath the Earth's surface, and a magma chamber is the subterranean cavity containing the gas-rich liquid magma, which feeds a volcano. A conduit is a passage followed by magma in a volcano. A vent is the opening at the Earth's surface through which volcanic materials can issue forth. And a cone is a volcanic cone built entirely of loose, fragmented material called pyroclastics, and or lava flows that erupted from the vent. Erupted material builds up within each eruption forming the cone. There's lots of different kinds of cones, by the way. So volcanic eruptions occur for a lot of different reasons. Um, one of them is high temperatures of the Earth's interior. The melting of the lower crust and mantle equals molten rock, which equals magma. At depths greater than 20 kilometers, the temperature is 800 to 1600 degrees Celsius, and the density of the magma is less than that of the crustal rock, and therefore it's going to rise to the surface. Well, one of the main questions is how does it get that hot in the first place? Well, some of it's residual cooling from the earth in the solar system, radioactive decay, and also convection in the mantle. Convection brings up the hot rock from near the interior of the Earth and returns the cooler material towards the center for reheating. This can also cr be created by shock or impact melting. For example, meteorite impacts produce instantaneous heat and melting from high energy collisions. There are two styles of volcanic eruption, explosive and diffusive. Explosive is where rapidly escaping gas bubbles or vesicles rip apart the magma, which fragments it. Effusive eruption is where the magma leaks out onto the surface passively as lava flows. Please note that some effusive eruptions involving highly viscous lava may turn into explosive eruptions. If the magma is too viscous or sticky, it can block up the volcanic vent, which traps gas inside the volcano and creates enough pressure. If this gas builds up to enough to break through the blockage, an extremely dangerous explosive eruption can form. Some of the most explosive eruptions have formed in this way, and this is an example. This was Pinatubo when it went up in 1991. It was an extremely explosive uh, eruption. If you release the pressure of a magma chamber by cracking the surrounding rock or breaking through to the surface, the gas dissolved in the magma will start to Ex exolve, which means to separate from the melt by forming bubbles. These bubbles, called vesicles, rapidly expand and rise up through the magma. So think about like shaking up a bottle of carbonated soda to build up the pressure and then taking the top off the bottle too quickly. Release the pressure, what happens? Well, it explodes out. The rapid ga escape of the gas or volatiles causes magma to fragment and erupt explosively just like that soda bottle would. The fallout of rock, debris, and ash from an explosive eruption column is called ash fall. An explosive volcanic eruption will propel large volumes of volcanic rock, ash, and gas into the atmosphere. The larger or most dense particles will fall out of the air quickly and close to the volcanic vent. The smaller particles, such as ash, can be suspended in the atmosphere for days to weeks before they fall back to Earth. Whilst in the atmosphere, the wind can transport the ash particles large distances. For example, when Mount Pinatubo went up in the Philippines in 1991, ash was blown all the way around the entire globe. Pyroclastic flows are hot, turbulent, fast-moving, high-particle concentration clouds of rock and gas. 
Pyroclastic flows can reach over 100 kilometers from a volcano, and they can travel hundreds of kilometers per hour and are commonly greater than 400 degrees Celsius in temperature. So they'll destroy everything in their path, including buildings, agriculture, and forests, not to mention people, animals, etc. Although because they contain a high concentration of particles and a low concentration of gases, they are dense and usually confined to and flow along topographic lows or valleys. It's extremely important to understand them as they are often the most hazardous component of a, an explosive eruption. A pyroclastic surge are low particle concentration, which means low density flows of volcanic material. The reason they are low density flows is because they don't have a high concentration of the particles and contain a lot of gas. Pyroclastic surges are very turbulent and fast, up to 300 kilometers per hour. The, they overtop high topographic features and therefore are not confined to valleys. In other words, they can go up and over mountains. Pyroclastic surges usually do not travel as far as pyroclastic flows, but pyroclastic surges can travel up to at least 10 kilometers from the source. A volcanic eruption dominated by passive outpouring of lava onto the Earth's surface is called an effusive eruption. This happens either because there's not enough gas or volatiles in the magma to break up, um, it, break it apart, or the magma is too viscous or sticky to allow the volatiles to escape quickly. Remember that molten rock is called magma when it's underneath the ground and called lava when it's erupted onto the surface. Lava flows generated by effusive eruptions vary in shape, thickness, length, and width depending on the type of lava erupted. Discharge rate, in other words, how fast it comes out of the vent, slope of the ground over which the lava travels, and the duration of the eruption. Although not generally as hazardous as explosive eruptions, lava flows can burn and bury buildings and forests and do pose a danger to people living on or near an active volcano. Volcanoes can be extremely hazardous natural phenomenon. That is why important, it's important to understand as much as possible about them in an attempt to understand the processes involved in the eruptions and try to minimize the risk to life and property. Many volcanoes are found in heavily populated areas. Volcanic soil is extremely fertile and rich in minerals, so people move to the sides of volcanoes to plant crops and graze their livestock. But this puts them in a great danger if there's an eruption. Large individual volcanic eruptions can cause numerous fatalities. However, such large catastrophic eruptions occur relatively infrequently, so volcanoes cause less fatalities than earthquakes, hurricanes, and famine. There are many small-scale eruptions occurring all over the world every day, but most are either in remote locations or are so small to, as to cause too much damage, and there are well-managed or only minimal risk to humans. But there are many hazards associated with volcanic eruptions. Perhaps the biggest hazard are the pyroclastic flows. As mentioned earlier, these are hot, fast-moving, high particle concentration flows of gas, rock, and ash, which is something you don't want to get in the way of. A famous historic example of an explosive eruption that produced devastating pyroclastic flows was the 79 AD eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Italy that buried the ancient Roman city of Pompeii and Herculaneum. On August 24, 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius literally blew its top, erupting tons of molten ash, pumice, which is volcanic rock that contains many vesicles or bubbles, and sulfuric gas miles into the atmosphere. The photo on the right shows a more recent eruption of Vesuvius, but this is the kind of thing that people living in Pompeii would have seen at the time, over on the left. Pyroclastic flows of poisonous gas and hot volcanic debris engulfed the cities of Pompeii, Herculaneum, and Stavie, suffocating the inhabitants and burying the buildings. The people and animals of Pompeii died in their sleep or trying to evacuate the town. If you visit Pompeii today, you can see the remains that have been unearthed. These ancient cities remained buried and undiscovered for almost 1,700 years until excavation began in 1748. These excavations continue today and are as entire cities are preserved as they were on the day in 79 AD, 
when they were hit by the pyroclastic flows from Vesuvius, they provide a uniquely preserved snapshot of Roman life and culture. Mount Vesuvius, by the way, is still considered an active volcano. The major Italian city of Naples lies approximately 30 kilometers from the volcanic vent, which is 1.5 million people involved in, they live in Naples, and as pyroclastic flows can travel as far as 100 kilometers from the source, this city is built well within the danger zone. Another example of the destructive power of pyroclastic flows occurred on the island of Martinique in the West Indies, when an eruption of Mount Pele produced a pyroclastic flow that completely destroyed the city of St. Pierre. So there's a before and after picture um, to the left and right. The force of the pyroclastic flow swept all of the buildings, inhabitants, and anything else in its path into the ocean. Some portion of the pyroclastic flow actually traveled over the ocean surface for several kilometers to burn ships that were moored in the harbor. Over 8,000 over 8, people were killed there in 1902. The only known survivor in St. Pierre became a minor celebrity. He was a husky 25-year-old roustabout named Louis Aguer Cyprius, or locally known simply as Samson. In early April, Samson was put in jail for wounding one of his friends with a cutlass. In other words, it's kind of a short sword. Towards the end of his sentence, he escaped from a laboring job in town, danced all night, and then turned himself back into the authorities the following morning. For this, he was sentenced to solitary confinement for a week in the prison's dungeon. On May 8th, he was alone in his dungeon with only a small, grated opening cut into the wall above the door. While waiting for his breakfast, his cell became dark and he was overcome by intense gusts of hot air mixed with ash and had entered through the grated opening. He held his breath while experiencing intense pain, and after a few moments the heat subsided and he was severely burned but managed to survive for four days before he was rescued by people exploring the ruins of St. Pierre. After he recovered, he received a pardon and eventually joined the Barnum and Bailey Circus where he toured the world billed as the lone survivor of St. Pierre. <clears throat> there were other survivors on the outskirts of the town and in some of the ships moored in the harbor. Mercifully, death came quickly to those that died, and some may have died by the sheer force of the pyroclastic flow, but most died within a few seconds after inhaling the burning fumes and ash of, of that flow. The throats and lungs of most of the dead were seared and their bodies badly burned. The most common cause of death in people hit by a pyroclastic flow is drowning, which means fluid in their lungs after the burns cause the fluid to be released. We've seen the effects of pyroclastic flows entering a town, but what are the exact processes that cause the damage? The direct force of a pyroclastic flow traveling at tens of meters per second and carrying boulders as large as houses can be extremely damaging. On the volcanic island of Montserrat in the West Indies, meter-scale blocks of volcanic rock when embedded tens of centimeters into concrete walls by the forces passing pyroclastic flow. The top right-hand photograph shows steel reinforcement bars that were once in the wall of a house, bent in the direction of the passing pyroclastic flow. As we previously saw, the entire city of St. Pierre and Martinique was swept into the ocean. The debris left behind from passing pyroclastic flows can bury structures very quickly. These are examples from a 97 eruption of the Sofrere Hills volcano in Montserrat. The pyroclastic flows produced buried the capital city of Plymouth. Pyroclastic flows have temperatures commonly in excess of 400 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough to burn forests and wooden structures. Here we can see a burnt trees after an eruption for the Mount St. Helens in the U.S. Lahar is an Indonesian term that describes a hot or cold mixture of water and rock fragments flowing down the slopes of volcano and or river valleys. Heavy rain after an eruption or hot volcanic activity melting snow and ice will provide a large volume of water that will flow down the sides of the volcano. This water picks up the newly erupted material, forming flash flowing torrents of water, mud, ash, rock, and debris. Lahars can flow great distances and be extremely destructive as well. 
Moving on from pyroclastic flows, there are other hazards associated with volcanic eruptions, such as pyroclastic fall. An explosive eruption will produce an eruption column of hot gases and debris ejected kilometers into the air. As this debris falls back down to the ground, it can cause a lot of damage. Like too much snow on a roof, too much ash raining down from an eruption column can cause the roof to collapse. Ash loading on power lines will cause them to fall, and as little as one centimeter of ash accumulated on the leaves of a plant will stop it from being able to photosynthesize, and therefore the plant will die. Lots of fine ash falling in lakes, rivers, and water reservoirs will cause contamination, making it unfit to drink or to live in if you're a fish. Very fine ash particles, if inhaled by humans, can cause extensive damage to the lungs, causing a respiratory disease called silicosis. Lava flows, though generally slower moving and less catastrophic than pyroclastic flows, still remain dangerous. Lava flows have temperatures in excess of 200 degrees Celsius and therefore will burn any flammable material it contacts. Thick lava flows will bury all in its path, including infrastructure, which is building roads, waterways, etc., and agricultural land. An example of a hazardous effusive eruption comes from the town of Vestmenjar in Iceland. In 1973, a large fissure crack opened up on the outskirts of the town and lava began to flow toward the buildings. The eruption happened at night and consequently caught the town's inhabitants by surprise. No one was killed by the lava flow, but about one-third of the town was destroyed. The people eventually stopped the advance of the lava flows by pumping seawater from the nearby harbor and spraying it onto the lava. This caused the front of the lava flow to cool quickly and stop moving and formed a barrier for the lava behind it. The residents of the town were able to stop and or divert the lava from the rest of the town. So what do we do about the dangers of volcanoes? We've learned about the dangers and risks involved with the eruptions, but what can we do about it? How can we understand more about volcanoes so we might forecast a future eruption? Well, the answer is volcano monitoring. Scientists set up laboratories or volcano observatories on the sides of active volcanoes to look for signs that the volcano is active and may have an eruption soon. As magma moves through the Earth's crust, it can alter its environment, producing signs that it's on its way to the surface. These signs are called precursors to an eruption. Precursors can include increased earthquakes in the area or increased seismicity, swelling and cracking of the ground, which means deformation, change in the amount of chemistry of the gas coming out of the volcano, or change in the groundwater levels or chemistry. Seismicity or earthquake activity, ground deformation, and gas output are the three most important precursors to an eruption. For example, the Montserrat Volcano Observatory in the West Indies will increase its alert level and warn the population if two out of these three precursors occur. This warning and increase in alert level may involve relocation of people and livestock to safer areas and or a ban on boats sailing within four kilometers of the volcano. Many eruptions are preceded by the increased levels of seismic activity. The earthquakes are caused by fracturing and brittle failure of the subsurface rocks as the new magma pushes its way up toward the surface. Earthquake activity is measured by seismographs. Seismographs are stationed on the flanks of the volcano and these record the frequency, duration, and intensity of the earthquakes and report it back to the volcano observatory. Changes in the seismic activity, especially an increase, may forca uh, forecast an eruption. Any deformation in the volcano can be measured by GPS surveys or tilt meters. Tilt meters can measure tiny changes in slope angle, as small as one part per million. A slope change of one part per million is equivalent to raising the end of a board one kilometer long, only one millimeter. So these are extremely sensitive. Tilt meters can tell the scientists when new magma has entered a magma chamber in the volcano, so figure A that you see here shows the volcano in a dormant or resting stage. Tilt meters on the sides of the volcano measure a shallow slope angle. When new magma enters a magma chamber, 
as you can see on the bottom right hand corner, the chamber swells to accommodate the larger volume. This causes the sides of the volcano to bulge out. It's blowing up like a balloon, so the more air you put into the middle of a balloon, the bigger the outside skin of the balloon gets. The tilt meters will now record a new steeper slope angle on the outside of the volcano. If fresh magma enters the magma chamber, this again may be a precursor to an eruption. New magma will increase the pressure in the magma chamber, causing more fracturing of the surrounding rock, which will produce earthquakes, and potentially the formation of a conduit to the surface. It is common for ground deformation and seismic activity to occur at the same time before an eruption occurs. When magma rises toward the surface to decrease in pressure, causes it to lose some of its gas content. As gas is released from the magma, it's often venting at the surface, leaking out of small cracks in the ground or from a large volcanic vent. A dormant volcano will commonly vent gases even when there is no eruption going on. This is because the magma is deep down in the crust, but still releasing gas, just not in the position to erupt at the surface. A change in the amount of gas or the chemistry of the gas being released is another precursor to an eruption. An increase in the amount of magma in the chamber will produce an increase in the amount of gas. And also the new magma may have a slightly different chemical composition to the old magma and therefore release different abundances of gas types such as carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, or water. For example, an increase in the ratio of carbon to sulfur can be used to indicate the arrival of a new batch of magma at the summit's reservoir. Gas or volatile comp composition and abundance can be measured directly from the volcano by gathering samples at the vents or fumaries. Using remote sensing techniques, we can also um, measure gas composition as well. For example, the amount of sulfur dioxide released by a volcano can be measured indirectly by a correlation spectrometer, or COSPEC. The spectrometer compares light coming through the volcanic plume to a known spectra of sulfur dioxide, which measures the sulfur dioxide plumes. Okay, so that comp completes the volcanic lecture. Make sure that you do your practice quiz on this material because it is fairly complex and you need to make sure that you understand it thoroughly. If you have any questions, of course, see me during office hours or send me an email. Have a great day.